General 2.5 Regulations, Maintenance, Space Forms, Records and Publications. Let's embark on a journey into an important aspect of aviation regulations, specifically focusing on maintenance requirements outlined in 14 CFR Part 43. Paragraph A. Emphasizes the need for aircraft and their components, whether U.S. or foreign registered under 14 CFR Part 121 or 135, to be maintained in accordance with the rules set forth in this part. Now, let's address a point of confusion highlighted in paragraph B, which outlines the types of aircraft exempt from this part. This has sparked considerable confusion within the aviation industry. If an aircraft is currently flying with a special airworthiness, experimental certificate, identified by the pink FAA Form 8137, and it's the sole airworthiness certificate the aircraft has ever had, paragraph 8 of 14 CFR Part 43 does not apply. However, complications arise during maintenance, particularly in cases of supplemental type certificate, STC, modifications. Sometimes, it becomes necessary to temporarily place the aircraft into special airworthiness, experimental to demonstrate compliance with federal regulations. Despite this temporary designation, it's crucial to note that these aircraft, under special airworthiness, experimental, must still undergo maintenance in accordance with 14 CFR Part 43. This is because the aircraft had a different type of airworthiness, for example, a standard airworthiness, prior to being issued the special airworthiness certificate. In conclusion, understanding these nuances is vital for anyone involved in aircraft maintenance, especially when dealing with unique situations like STC modifications and temporary shifts in airworthiness status. As we explore further in our discussion today, keep in mind the practical implications of these regulations in the dynamic field of aviation. Section 43.2, Records of Overhaul and Rebuilding is a critical aspect of aviation maintenance addressing key terms not explicitly defined in 14 CFR Part 1. These terms play a crucial role in work on aircraft components and include disassembly, cleaning, inspection, repairs as necessary, reassembly, and testing. Understanding these terms is fundamental to ensuring precision and adherence to safety standards in aviation maintenance. A notable distinction in testing methods is crucial within this context. When an item is overhauled, it undergoes testing according to approved standards documented by the manufacturer. This process reflects the service limits for used parts, providing a comprehensive evaluation. On the other hand, when an item is rebuilt, it must undergo testing to the same tolerances and limits as a new item. This stringent process ensures that the rebuilt item aligns with the standards set for brand new components, emphasizing a high level of precision and reliability. The significance of these distinctions becomes evident as they directly impact the reliability of aircraft systems. A clear understanding of these terms and processes is essential for aviation maintenance professionals to maintain the integrity and safety of the aircraft. In this exploration of Section 43.3, persons authorized to perform maintenance, preventive maintenance, rebuilding, and alterations, were delving into the individuals and entities entrusted with the responsibility of conducting maintenance on aircraft. It's crucial to grasp the FAA's definition of person, which encompasses a wide array of entities, ranging from individuals and firms to corporations, associations, and governmental bodies, along with trustees, receivers, assignees, or similar representatives. Now, who are the authorized players in this realm? First off, we have individuals holding a certificated mechanic qualification, followed by those certified as repairmen under 14 CFR Part 65. Additionally, Individuals working under the supervision of a certificated mechanic or repairman are recognized, along with entities holding a repair station certificate. Air carrier certificate holders and pilots with Part 61 certificates are on the list, allowing them to perform preventive maintenance under specific conditions. Sport pilot certificate holders also have a role, permitted to conduct preventive maintenance on light sport category aircraft they own or operate. Helicopter pilots under Part 135 operating in remote areas have their own set of conditions allowing specific preventive maintenance tasks. Part 135 certificate holders may permit pilots to remove and reinstall cabin seats, stretchers, and cabin-mounted medical oxygen bottles, provided they meet certain criteria. And lastly, manufacturers have the authority to inspect and rebuild any item they've produced. This tapestry of roles is fundamental to our aviation landscape ensuring that maintenance tasks are executed by qualified individuals or entities in strict accordance with regulations. 
This mosaic of responsibilities assigned to different players plays a pivotal role in the overarching goal of maintaining airworthiness in our dynamic aviation environment. Now, let's delve into the critical process outlined in Section 43.5, Approval for Return to Service After Maintenance, Preventive Maintenance, Rebuilding, and Alterations. This stage involves the meticulous task of approving an aircraft component for return to service post-maintenance, preventive maintenance, rebuilding, or alteration. The entire process kicks off with the creation of a meticulous maintenance record entry, as mandated by either 14 CFR Part 43, with specific reference to Section 43.9 or 43.11. In cases of major repairs or alterations, FAA Form 337, aptly named Major Repair and Alteration, comes into play. Before we dive into the nitty-gritty of documentation, technicians must grasp three fundamental aspects. Firstly, a crystal-clear understanding of the task at hand is imperative. Technicians need to know precisely what they are going to do. Secondly, the work's classification by the FAA should be well understood, ensuring alignment with regulatory standards. Lastly, a keen awareness of the documentation requirements is paramount. Technicians must be well versed in the specific type of documentation needed to adequately support the undertaken activity. This trifecta of understanding, task clarity, FAA classification, and documentation requirements, forms the bedrock for a seamless and compliant process for approving an aircraft component's return to service. Now, let's discern whether the task at hand falls under the category of repair or alteration. A repair aims to restore the aircraft to its previous, unaltered condition, while an alteration inherently modifies the aircraft from its prior state. The second consideration involves determining whether the work is major or minor. A major action has a substantial impact on various facets such as weight, balance, structural strength, performance, power plant operation, flight characteristics, or other qualities influencing airworthiness. This brings us to the third question, the type of documentation required. Minor repairs and alterations can refer to acceptable data, like manufacturer's maintenance manuals or AC 43.131, and these can be duly recorded as logbook entries. However, major repairs and alterations necessitate approved data. Examples include AD notes, supplemental type certificates, STCs, type certificate data sheets, TCDS, designated engineering representative, DUR, specific delegations, and FAA approved manufacturer service bulletins, SB. For further clarification and examples, you can consult 14 CFR Part 1 and Part 43, Appendix A. A nuanced understanding of these distinctions and adherence to the correct procedures are paramount to maintaining the airworthiness of the aircraft. But what if the repair or alteration lacks previously approved data? In such instances, technicians can initiate a field approval process with the FAA. This meticulous process involves several steps to ensure compliance with regulations. The technician completes the front side of Form 337 through Block 6, leaving Block 3 open for later FAA approval. In Block 8 on the back of the form, the technician outlines the work to be done and references the substantiating data. The completed Form 337 is submitted to the local FAA Flight Standards District Office FSDO, for a thorough review and approval by an Aviation Safety Inspector AC. During the review, the AC may seek input from other ASIs or FAA specialists for a comprehensive evaluation of the data. If the data aligns with FAA regulations, the AC enters one of the following statements in Block 3 of Form 337, depending on the extent of the review. The alteration or repair identified herein complies with the applicable airworthiness requirements and is approved for use only on the above described aircraft, subject to conformity inspection by a person authorized in 14 CFR Part 43, Section 43.7. This meticulous process ensures that even in situations without pre-approved data, the FAA meticulously reviews and approves the work, upholding the necessary standards for airworthiness. As our discussion progresses, bear in mind the pivotal significance of adherence to these procedures in the realm of aviation maintenance. Now, let's delve into the individuals authorized to sign Return to Service RTS, documentation, a pivotal step in concluding maintenance work. Seven distinct persons are outlined in this section, each possessing unique qualifications. Firstly, we have the Certificated Mechanic or Inspection Authorization EA, holder. This includes individuals with a Certificated Mechanic Qualification or those holding an Inspection Authorization EA. 
Next, the holder of a repair station certificate refers to entities possessing a repair station certificate. The manufacturer of the aircraft or component holds the authority for RTS documentation. Entities with an air carrier certificate are also empowered to sign off on RTS. Certificated private pilots with the appropriate certifications are included in this list. For maintenance on light sport aircraft, the repairman certificated with a maintenance rating for light sport aircraft, LSA, only is authorized. Lastly, certificated sport pilots are empowered for preventive maintenance on aircraft owned and operated by them. It's crucial to note that while a certificated repairman can work on a product undergoing maintenance, preventive maintenance, rebuilding, or alterations, refer to 14 CFR Part 43, Section 43.3, they lack the authority to approve the product for return to service, RTS. Instead, they must diligently make the necessary maintenance record entry in accordance with the requirements of 14 CFR Part 43, Section 43.9 or 43.11. Comprehending the individuals authorized to sign off on RTS documentation is vital for ensuring regulatory compliance and upholding the airworthiness of aircraft. As we proceed, bear in mind the distinct roles each individual plays in this critical process. Let's delve into the intricacies of maintenance record entries, specifically focusing on 14 CFR Part 43, Section 43.9. Firstly, why does 14 CFR Part 43, Section 43.9 specifically exclude inspection entries, and why is it crucial to differentiate between maintenance and inspection? Notably, this section exclusively deals with maintenance record entries, leaving inspection entries to be covered in 14 CFR Part 43, Section 43.11. Now, considering preventive maintenance, which is listed among the maintenance actions according to 14 CFR Part 43, Section 43.3, who is authorized to perform preventive maintenance, and what is crucial for them to do afterward. Let's break down the maintenance entry into three key components. What? Examples of what should be included in the what component of a maintenance entry. When? The significance of specifying the date the work was completed in a maintenance record entry. Who? Information required under the who component of a maintenance entry and why it is significant. If a certificated pilot performs preventive maintenance on their aircraft, what should they ensure is documented in the maintenance record entry, and why is this documentation important? Now, let's touch on major repairs or alterations. If the maintenance action involves a major repair or alteration, what form must be used, and what supporting documentation is required. In the case of a major repair performed by a certificated repair station, what alternative documentation can be used in place of FAA Form 337? Understanding these details is crucial for accurate and compliant maintenance record entries. Feel free to share your thoughts on these questions as we delve deeper into these critical aspects of aviation maintenance. Today. Our focus lies on a critical aspect of aviation maintenance outlined in 14 CFR Part 43, a regulation that was introduced as part of the 2002 update. This regulation brings attention to life-limited parts, introducing terms such as life-limited part and life status. These terms address parts with specified mandatory replacement limits and denote the accumulated cycles, hours, or other mandatory limits of such components. Moving ahead, the regulation outlines procedures for handling life-limited parts, especially when temporarily removed and reinstalled on a type certificated product or when transferred between such products. The emphasis is on preventing the inadvertent installation of a part that has reached its life limit, and technicians have seven methods to choose from for compliance. These methods include record-keeping, tagging, non-permanent marking, permanent marking, segregation, mutilation, or any other method approved or accepted by the FAA. The regulation also stresses the importance of transferring life status information when a life-limited part is moved between type certificated products. Now, let's delve into a couple of questions for discussion. Why do you believe it's crucial to have specific regulations governing the management of life-limited parts, particularly when they are removed from an aircraft? Among the seven compliance methods provided, which one do you think might be the most effective, and what considerations contribute to your perspective? If you click, like, and, subscribe, and leave a comment, we will provide a coupon for a free PDF download one of nine ebooks. However, each individual can only download up to, one, out of nine ebooks for free. 